good morning, everybody. Hey, it's good to see you here again. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, it's a little bit hard to believe that we're already this time of year. Um, you know, I, I always, it just seems like Christmas comes up so very fast, you know, from Thanksgiving to Christmas, and then it's the end of the year before you know it. Every year, I, I begin to, at this time, I don't know if you're like me, but I just kind of begin to reflect, uh, look at the year that God has given me and the time that God has given me, and just begin to evaluate a little bit about things um, this year, about things upcoming for the year ahead, evaluating, you know, okay, God, uh, man, what, what did you want to do in me this year? And did I allow you to do it? That's always a good question. Uh, God, where is it that you would have me to, to maybe give a little bit more faith in? Or, God, where do you want me to trust you a little bit more? And, and did I do that this year? I'm always kind of evaluating things like that, especially for our church family as well, as we look at the next year and thinking about, okay, God, where is it that you would take us? How is it that you would have us to go forward? And, and where, were, where, where would be some areas, God, that if we could do anything by your power, that's what you would want us to do? And I begin to think about those things, and not just kind of introspective, but as well as church family things, you know, thinking about, okay, God, where do you want us to grow deeper as well as wider? And those are the type of evaluating questions that we ask ourselves from time to time. And um, truth is, we, we want to be prepared, right? Whether it's individually in our own lives or as a church, we want to be prepared for wherever that God has us to go for whatever God has for us to do within the body of Christ. And, and that's one of the things as we kind of get into this time of year, when we start thinking about end of the year giving, when we think about your generosity, man, I mean, as a church family, this body of Christ, um, it's been incredible to see some of the things that God has done in and through you over the years. Um, and, and for those of you that are new to our church family, it's been so very, very true. Uh, for, for some of you, just your continued faithfulness, year in and year out, week by week, uh, how you've shown support to our church, how, how at, the, at the end of the year, and, and most of you know this, if you've ever been a part of a church or, or maybe our church, you know that we really rely you know, on the end of the year giving and, and for people to really come through for us, not just from a one-time gift, but for those of you that have tied to this church for so many years. But I get excited thinking about, okay, God, Again, what are some of the things that you want to do in us and through us when it comes to that, especially as it relates to our happy birthday Jesus offering? Again, for those of you that have been a part of our church family, you know every year we focus on one uh, kind of initiative that we try to, you know, give above and beyond towards, right? We try to think of something where it's not just inwardly but outwardly. That, that we can kind of surround ourselves with and kind of put forth and lean into the Holy Spirit and say, God, how could you use us in this way? And uh, I want you to know, first of all, how appreciative I am um, as a pastor here, appreciative of all of you who uh, just kind of lean into us and, and say, you know what, I, I, I believe in the mission of CCLG, I believe in what you're about. As we head into next year, 2020, it's going to be such a pivotal year for us um, as a church family. Um, what God has done, what he continues to do in and through our church is, is such a significant thing. And the truth is we can't do it without you, um, every single one of you. You're so important to the family of believers here. And I'm not just talking about financially, I mean even service-wise. Uh, so many of you serve, so many of you serve uh, and have served in, in various roles and capacities for years on end, right? I mean, I mean, 30 years, 40 years, many of you. And so there's so many things that God has done, continues to do in and, and through you, and it just wouldn't be possible without you. And, and if you haven't yet started to think or to pray about you know, how you might get involved or what God may do through you and in you, um, it's a good time to do that because as we kind of think about these things, God lays on our hearts different things, you know, and, and that really kind of brings me back to the happy birthday Jesus offering. For those of you that, that don't know, I mean, this is one of those things that, like I said, uh, year after year, God just seems to provide for. And um, this year, man, we're excited to be able to partner with a couple of organizations. And we always divide up our Happy Birthday Jesus offering so that we can make a, a wider impact. And uh, so this year we're actually partnering with the school across the street, San Miguel Elementary School. Uh, we're gonna be uh, partnering with them to help provide shoes 
to students that don't uh, have the funds to be able to have shoes, right? And, and there are so many times families they run into hard and difficult times, and, and they just don't have the money to, to buy shoes. And so we're going to be partnering with them, and we're going to be partnering with an organization I'm really excited about called Samaritan's Feet. You know, we, Samaritan's Purse is an organization we partner with through Operation Christmas Child and other things. And they have an organization called Samaritan's Feet that is so cool because what they do is uh, the, the money, the proceeds that come in, they literally go worldwide to third world countries all across our world that... Um, that in, in, in people groups and tribes where kids, they just don't have shoes. They just don't. And, and so that's what Samaritan's Feet does. It comes in, uh, it's, it's, they, they get on the ground. They, they actually, as they're delivering shoes to the kids and to some of the adults who need them, they wash their feet. And they, and they give them uh, some scripture and, and, and they talk to them and get them connected to some of the, the churches and local community groups there. And it's just so cool. In fact, I brought a video. I, it's a short video. I want you to see uh, kind of what we are partnering with as we go into our Happy Birthday Jesus offering. So check this out. Isn't that exciting? I hope that you can get excited about that. Uh, half of our offering is going to go to that. Half of it is also going to go to another worthy cause, which is the mission, the vision of CCLG. Uh, we have various things that we are a part of and need to be doing this next year. And uh, so we're going to be focusing in on that vision and that mission that God has called us to. And so hopefully you can be thinking about that, praying about that. If you've got a bulletin, uh, you'll see that, 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 that offering uh, envelope. And if you haven't spent time praying about it, what I really want you to do is uh, just take it home and pray over it, okay? And just ask God what he may uh, want you to do. And this is a give above and beyond, okay, of, of what God has given you. And so just take some time, think about it, pray about it. Um, we will have some of those available uh, at our welcome desk uh, out in the uh, out in the gym, and, and you will have access to those for the next four weeks uh, till the end of the year in order to be able to give in that kind of way. And so uh, enough of that. Let's go to our Bibles. If you've got a Bible with you this morning, turn to Genesis chapter 32, okay? That's where we're going to start today, Genesis chapter 32, and uh, we're going to look at a few different passages but we're going to jump into this chapter, and we're kind of going to get, jump about halfway down in this chapter, in this passage. We're going to look at verse 22 here in just a second. But we're kind of jumping into this guy's life named Jacob. And um, I want us to look at this, and, and I want you to know kind of out of the gate a little bit about Jacob, if you don't know. But he's kind of a, a, a person that we would say has messed up quite a bit in life. In fact, there are things that haven't been going so well for him, and a lot of it's based on his own decisions, his own decision-making process. And a long story short, Jacob finds himself in a situation where he's finally returning home after a very, very long time, and the last time he left, it was not on very good terms. And so let's jump in here in verse 22, and then I want to pray, and we'll get on with the rest of this message, okay? Verse 22, look there. It says, that night Jacob got up and he took his two wives, now at that point, you're thinking to yourself, okay, anybody got questions? Well, you should have. He got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and again, you know, uh, maybe you have questions about that as well. His 11 sons, and they crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So it says, Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Look at verse 25. It says, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. This is a pretty incredible story. Verse 26, so the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked him, he says, well, what's your name? Jacob, he answered. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Let's pray together. God, we just come before you this morning, honored to be able to open your word and hear whatever message you would have for us. And so God, I know that there are different people who come in with different burdens they're carrying this morning. There are, there are some, perhaps, God, that, that came in with 
very calloused hearts, callous souls. There's some, Father, that the burdens that they're carrying are so many, so much, they wouldn't even know be, where to begin to lay them at your feet. And my prayer, God, is that by the end of our time together, you will begin to unpack and unfold, cut into our hearts in such a way, God, that we not only know it's you, but we know that that's why we're here. And so God, help us now as we continue to study your word. Help us to hear from your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me see your hands this morning. I just kind of want to poll everybody. How many of you have finally gotten your Christmas trees up? Let's just see. I want to see. Okay, good, good. We're not here to shame any of you that haven't. Okay, that's not what it's about. Don't think we're into shaming non-Christmas tree, you know, preparedness. That's not, that's not it. Some of you have actually probably had your Christmas tree up before Thanksgiving. Let me see your hands. I know I asked that one time a couple weeks back. I got a couple here, a couple over here. Okay, all right. See, some of you guys, we don't even understand you. It's like Christmas for two months in your house, right? And uh, that, that's, that's a bit overwhelming for some of us. How many of you, let me ask you this, how many of you use real Christmas trees? That's you. Like you're, you're, you're avid about real Christmas trees, okay? Some of you, all right, very good. What about, what about, what about me? You use real fake Christmas trees. Raise your hand, okay? That, that's you, real fake Christmas trees. Yeah, me too. You know, part of the reason why we do that, though, is because we have dogs. And you know what dogs like to do with trees, Right? And we don't want that to happen in our house, but sometimes it does anyway. But some of you, you know, you love Christmas trees, right? I love Christmas trees. You love picking Christmas trees out. Uh, you know, you love the whole process of that, right? And, and uh, picking out that perfect tree, setting it up, right? If, if it's not a living tree, even just setting it up, decorating it, hanging the lights, on the Christmas tree, talking about the various ornaments, right, that we've collected over the years as we put those on the Christmas tree. You know, I was thinking about that. Christmas trees have really kind of become a centerpiece in a lot of our homes, hasn't it? I mean, it's one of those things that it's just not Christmas sometimes without a tree. I was just talking to one of our guys that came and helped set up yesterday. He was, he was contemplating because it was just going to be him this Christmas. And, and his wife was, was traveling. He's like, well, I don't know. Should I set up a tree? Should I not set up a tree? Right? But, but it is. It's a big deal for a lot of us. And we're, really what I want you to know is trees are a big deal in general when it comes to the Bible. If you look at the Bible and read, there, there are all kinds of, of, of examples where trees are important, both literally as well as metaphorically, from Genesis to Revelation. In Genesis, you look all the way back, God places a tree in the middle of the Garden of Eden, and he calls it the tree of knowledge, right? And the message, pretty much, that goes along with this tree is you can either trust God with your life, Trust what, that he, what he has in store for you is the best life, or you can go against that, take things into your own, you know, plan and purpose, and manipulate, which is what, unfortunately, Adam and Eve do. Then you, you get to Revelation. You, we read about another tree that's also kind of mentioned in Genesis, but it's the tree of life. But by the time you get to Revelation, this tree of life, it's, it's in heaven. And it's this way of God bringing peace and healing to all of mankind. No more crying, the Bible says, no more suffering, no more pain. It's such a beautiful picture. We, we read that King David one time, he says this in Psalms 1, that if you listen to the voice of God, you're like a tree that's planted by the streams of living water. He says your leaves, they will always be green. We read the, the prophet Jeremiah, for example, he would say something very similar. He would say that those who put their hope and their confidence in God, they're like trees whose roots go down deep. Though even though a, a drought were to happen, they still are able to produce fruit. Even Jesus himself, 
He would use different descriptions of trees at different points in his life. He, he described one example uh, this way. In John chapter 15, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And the only thing that you need to do, Jesus says, is you need to stay connected to me. You see, the point is trees, we see, they're, they're all over the Bible. They're a big deal. And that's even true when we look at the, the very first chapter of the very first book in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. There we find another kind of tree, but in this example, it's actually Jesus' family tree. And it's actually, I mean, when we read the Bible so often, many, many times you've read the first part of Matthew, we, we tend to skip over the family tree, of Jesus. It's not something we usually pay a whole lot of attention to. It just looks like a bunch of names. If you're using a King James version of the Bible, there's a lot of begetting going on, right? So and so begat so and so who then begat them, right? And all these begats. If you got another version of the Bible, then you see that it's so and so is the father of this person, and then they were born this person. Look at Matthew chapter 1. I want us to look there at just the first couple of verses. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It says, this is the record of the genealogy or ancestors of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the son of David, it says in some translations, which simply means that, 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 that not that, again, Jesus is somehow the direct son of David, but that he is a descendant of David who is the son of Abraham, and Abraham was the father of Isaac, it says, and Isaac was the father of Jacob. Now, the reason I want to start there is because that's the person we just read about in Genesis 32, Jacob. We see here that this is how Matthew decides that he is going to start his account of Jesus, the gospel account of Jesus. Now, I don't know if you've ever done any study of your own genealogy at some point, but it's a fun thing to do, right? If you've ever been like me, I've done the free version of Ancestry.com, and, and so you can find out a few things that way, and sometimes they're running specials on it, and, and if you've ever done that, it's kind of an interesting thing to do. Here's what I want you to know. In the first century, right, in the time that we're talking about here, when it comes to the, the Jewish and the Hebrew culture, th that wouldn't be something that they would do for fun, because for them, their family tree, it meant everything. In fact, that's how they acquired their identity really in life. I mean, it was through their family tree. They got credibility through their family for better or worse in some cases. It's sort of like your birth certificate along with your social security card, along with your, you know, ID, along with you know, a background check of whatever kind that you have. I mean, it's all those kind of things all wrapped up in one. It helped define you in that way your family tree did. And so Matthew, he's writing, we know this, to a mostly Jewish audience, right, and who's, who, who they, they care. They care a lot about Jesus' family tree. And so those are the ones who are hearing this, who are reading it. He says, this is the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the one that he's, and by the way, what, the, way the way he says that, he, he's simply telling them, that's the one that our ancestors talk so much about. The one who is to come. And so it's not surprising. What is surprising is that we look at this family tree, Matthew chooses to include some people on this list that you think to yourself, why in the world did he include them? And the reason is real simple, bloodlines matter. Bloodlines, they, they matter, and, and this is really kind of the message of this chapter. Bloodlines matter because family matters. And it's interesting who Matthew chooses to include here in Jesus' family tree. There's another family tree that we read about uh, Jesus in, in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to get to that a little bit later on in this series. But it's interesting who Matthew chooses to include in this family tree because Matthew, he could edit it somewhat, okay? And that was very common in the patriarchal system of their society, but he doesn't. And I was thinking about that, you know, have, have you ever been tempted 
to want to edit your family tree? I mean, have you ever thought, you know, of that crazy uncle? Maybe you're the crazy uncle, right? Have you ever thought about that, that distant aunt that nobody likes to talk to, and when they do talk to them, it's always a whisper, right? They're coming to dinner tonight, really? I mean, you ever been tempted to want to prune your family tree, if you could? If you ever felt that way, you ever had those family members, maybe you are that family member, then you're going to be able to relate to Jesus very well. Because, listen, his family tree had plenty of them. As we look at his family tree, Matthew includes men, which isn't very surprising. Again, a patriarchal society, that was usually the case. But it is surprising that he not only includes men, he also includes women. And that is very interesting. He lists several of them. We're going to talk a couple of them, uh, about a couple of those in this series. But not only does he go against the, the flow of, of cultural norms, I would say, he also includes what I would say are some very broken branches. He, he includes some very bent and out of shape and crooked branches. He, he, he includes what I would say are some very withered branches in the family tree of Jesus. He, he includes liars and cheats, manipulators, adulterers. He, he includes even murderers. You see, you see, Jesus was related to some very embarrassing people. And here's what that says to us. Think about this. Jesus came through imperfect people for imperfect people. And it's interesting, he didn't clean any of it up. He doesn't even really apologize for it. Ma Matthew says, hey, this is Jesus' family tree. This is his bloodline. In, in fact, in his family tree, it, it, it could be symbolized, you know, if you think about it like, a, like a Christmas tree, right? And we have all kinds of Christmas trees on the stage on, on our, our sign over here. Jesus' family tree would not be like this one. It wouldn't be like the Rockefeller Center. We throw up that, that, that picture there. Some of you watch on TV the lighting of the, this great tree. It's amazing every single year. We actually uh, we did a family trip with some of the other families in our church. We got to go to this very area where this tree is, is at. Jesus' family tree wouldn't look like that. It, it actually probably looked more like, go, go to the other slide. And I shared this with you the, the, a few weeks ago. This is... Charlie, Brown, Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. You see, Jesus probably, his Christmas tree looked more like that. And, and you know what I love about that? It's because truth be told, all of us here this morning, all of us listening, we could relate to that way more than we could the other one. And Matthew, I think he's trying to communicate something to us about this. And so in this series, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to look at these limbs of Jesus' family tree. And the first one that I want to look at is this one of Jacob. And we've already looked a little bit at a story, but let me just kind of tell you a little bit. If you want to do some own, your own study, in the book of Genesis, his life kind of goes from Genesis chapter 25 all the way to chapter 49. There's a really big portion in Genesis about Jacob, which is kind of interesting because I've already told you. He's very messed up. His life is really messed up at times. And there's a lot of uh, things that happen that we think, wow, really? God chose him? I mean, in fact, we can say it like this. If there's one thing we can say about Jacob more than anything else, it's that Jacob was a broken vessel. And what I mean by that is Jacob, he was a vessel of God for sure. There's no doubting that. In fact, God uses Jacob in tremendous ways, especially as it relates to the overall redemptive plan of humanity. To see Jacob's role in that, he plays such a big role in God's plan. But on the flip side, it's also very evident that he is a broken vessel. So much so that I mean, when I look at it and I read the account, just like you read the account, I don't even know why God chooses him. I mean, especially over his brother Esau, he's the one that deserved his father's blessing in the first place. Jacob, he just, 
He sort of just keeps making a mess of things as he goes through. He, he always just seems to capitalize on one wrongdoing with another wrongdoing. And, and yet, what we see in the scriptures is simultaneously, he's also one of the more important figures that God uses in his redemptive plan. And I don't know about you, but there's something, when I think about that, when I hear it, there's something about that that gives me uh, a lot of comfort. Because if God can use somebody like Jacob, then maybe there is a little bit of hope for me. Maybe there is a little bit of hope for us. You see, Jacob, he was born in a, a very dysfunctional family. And, and it's not, by the way, I mean, it's not like our families are always dysfunctional. In fact, you may come from a very healthy family. You may think, you know, my family's you know, got a lot of good things together. You know, it's not like, it's not like we're dysfunctional all, all the time. But if we're being honest, we'd say that, yeah, things do get crazy sometimes, Right? Times do get a little bit hairy. I mean, it's, it's a part of our brokenness. It's a part of our baggage that we all carry along with us at some point in life. Family just gets messy. When you take Jacob, I mean, even his mom, Rebecca, and his dad, Isaac, they, they had their own baggage, and, and, and they brought that baggage in to their families. And the point is, well, what do you do, right? What do you do with that stuff? What do, what do you do with the baggage, the messiness well, here's what I can tell you in Jacob's case. What, what, what he chose to do, which I wouldn't recommend, is, is he chose to try to be in control of everything. In fact, we could call him a manipulative person. Pro probably not because he was trying to be a bad guy. I don't think that was the case at all. But that's how he usually dealt with it. That's how he usually responded. Most of his life, Jacob was trying to control circumstances. And he was always trying to control different people that God brought into his life. And, and he, was, he was this control freak, we could say. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 26, we, we are told about his birth. And his mom, you know, we learn, has twins, his older brother Esau was born first. And then we, we read, th then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob. See, it's interesting. Jacob was even born trying to control the situation. I mean, coming out of the very womb, grabbing his twin brother's heel. He's like, hey man, get back in here. I want to go first, right? It's weird, but it's true. And Isaac and Rebecca, they see this tendency, and so they're like, hey, let's name this kid Jacob. Which, for those of you that are named Jacob here, I, I apologize, but in the Bible, the, the root of that is deceiver. You don't want to know what, you know, my root name goes to, okay? That's beside the point, but it means manipulator. Jacob is... The reason he was named that is because he was trying to control situations, manipulate situations. And in fact, he wanted that firstborn blessing so badly. Probably the most well-known story. Many of you have read this before. You've heard it before. One of the most well-known stories is that a while later, his, his brother is out hunting, right? And Esau, that's what he was, was a hunter. And he comes in. He's really hungry, so, so very hungry. And Jacob, meanwhile, he's fixing dinner. And so Jacob sees he's got an opportunity to control a situation, and, and what he's cooking smells so delicious, and es Esau, he's famished, the Bible says, and, and so Jacob, he cons his brother into trading his birthright for his appetite. And inevitably, what we see here and what happens is it, it splits the family apart. Esau becomes so furious with Jacob that Jacob, he packs up his things and he leaves. In fact, from this point on, what we read about Jacob's life, he's on the run for the rest of his life. And unfortunately, Jacob, he never really kind of learns a lesson. He just kind of keeps making some of the same mistakes. And the more out of control his life gets, and listen, this is something we can relate to. The more out of control his life got, the more he tried to control things. And the more he did that, the more of a mess he made. I'm just wondering, 
Is there anybody here that can relate to that? Because I know I can. Have you ever tried to push God out of his rightful place of control in your life so that you can manipulate or make things happen? Things perhaps that you think they should happen or they should happen the way that you want them to. And whenever you do that, you only make things worse. I've done that. And the more we try to control what feels like it's out of control, the more we tend to lose control. And later, it was time for, for Jacob to, to get married in life. And it, wouldn't you know, he tries to control that situation as well. He, he, he sees this young lady that he really, really, really wants to marry, and so he meets her father, Laban. And he says, you know what, I really want to marry your daughter. But Laban, he, he doesn't want Jacob to marry that daughter. He wants him to marry a different daughter. And so he says, okay, the only way I'm going to let you marry this daughter of mine is if you do something for me. And isn't it interesting that Laban's a lot like Jacob, and he tries to control the situation, tries to manipulate. He's like, listen, if you work for me seven years, uh, I'll give you the hand of my daughter in marriage. And so he finally does it, and the father-in-law, he, he didn't actually think he would even do it, but he does. And he still is like, I don't want you to marry her. I have this other daughter, that, I, that it's fine, but I don't want you to marry her. And so, listen, on Jacob's wedding day, he throws this big party. He gets him so drunk that Jacob actually sleeps with the wrong woman. Now, talk about ruining a honeymoon. This is a bad situation here. And to make things worse, I mean, it's kind of like a Jerry Springer episode already, right? Jacob's like, man, forget all this. I don't want to have any part of this. And so what he tries to do is betray Laban, he tries to kind of flip the script, so to speak. And so he tries to control the situation that his father-in-law is in control of. And that only creates more conflict, more of a situation to where just like he's running from his older brother, then he has to run away from Laban as well. I mean, talk about a twisted story, right? And that's what he is. He's a mess. He's on the run. The more out of control things got in his life, the more complicated the circumstances became. And Jacob would, 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 would just try his best to, to make you know, his control over things and manipulate. And that's what we just read, read about here in, in Genesis chapter 32. He's got to this point in his life where he is utterly exhausted. So much so that his health isn't doing good. He's not sleeping. He's stressed out. He doesn't know what to do. Again, can I, can I just, I don't want to name in on this, but isn't there times where we feel the same way? Things are just crazy in life. It's affecting every single part of your life. Relationships are suffering because of it. Work is suffering because of it. Your health may be suffering because of it. I mean, you know, th think about Christmas. Christmas is always so great. We love it. We love decorating. We love listening to Christmas songs, singing Christmas songs. But sometimes it just adds to the stress. It just adds to the anxiety level. And so here's what I want to ask this morning. What do you do? What do you do when that's you? What do you do when you feel stressed out? What do you do? How do you handle it? When things start to get out of control in your life, what do you do? Do you worry? Do, do, do you stress out even more? Do you lash out? Do, do, you, do you run to an addiction of some kind? Do, do you withdraw and you hide, you run away, you, you take cover? What do you do? Where do you turn? I mean, honestly. You know, do, do, you, do you eat a little bit more? I know I do. Do you drink more? Do you try to manipulate things even more, do you make more of a mess? See, this is where I think this preaches, right? I think this is what Jesus had in mind when he gives these really compassionate words. And, and you may, these may sound very familiar to you. Matthew chapter 11. I love this particular scripture here. Verses 28 through 30. Jesus 
would say this, come to me, all of you. And, and by the way, he says all of you. He, he doesn't just say the good people, or he doesn't just say the bad people, or he doesn't just say those people who have all their stuff together, all their ducks in a row. He says, come to me, everyone, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, which, again, if, if we're just kind of being truthful, we'd say that's all of us at various times, especially this time of year. It says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. What, what an incredible thing for Jesus to say. And then the next thing that Jesus says is, is a bit confusing at first because we read that Jesus goes on to say, take my yoke upon you. And when you read that, you think, okay, yoke, I mean, I've seen that before. I've, I've heard about that. I mean, isn't that what you put on animals to help plow fields? I mean, Jesus, I mean, wait a minute here. You, you, you want me to, to, to confine you to get rest, and now you're telling me to go to work? I want you to hold on to that thought. Let's finish this. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle in heart, Jesus says, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And, and let me just say this. I think this is kind of the, the pushback. When we read this right here and we think about it, this is kind of the pushback we get. If you're here and you're kind of a control freak or, or you're, you're here and you're like me, I mean, I've been there before where I've tried to manipulate things to get what, the, what I want or to do things that I feel like need to happen. If you've ever been in that situation, you're sitting here thinking to yourself, now wait a second, if I don't worry, then who's going to worry? Or, or we think like this, if I don't work harder, or if I don't try harder or work longer, then who's going to? Or take, you know, responsibility and manipulating things to make things better. If I don't do that, if I don't make something better, then, then who's going to? I think Jesus is saying to us, who, who, th those of us that are here that are weary and who carry heavy burdens, Jesus is like, I'm, I, I want to give you rest. He says, take, take my yoke upon you. And, and listen, he, he's telling you, he, he's telling you, it's not that you shouldn't go to work. It's something I tell my kids all the time. Work smarter, not harder. Not necessarily. I mean, he, he says, take my yoke upon you. And, 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 and let, me, let me say this. In the first century world, I mean, agricultural society, right? I mean, they, they would take a yoke on an ox that, and they would plow the fields with him. And, and, and most of the time, if it was a good farmer, it would be a custom-made yoke. Because if, if it wasn't, if it's just a general yoke, it would literally rub against the ox all day long, right? Until it would rub him raw, right? And, and then it, it would, couldn't work anymore. It would be overworked. A good farmer, he would take a, a yoke and he would make it just for that ox so that it could work better and he could get more out of it and it could have a better life. See, this is, this is what I think Jesus is saying. He's telling us this. He, he's saying, there's a better way to live life. G Jesus is saying, put my yoke upon you it's a custom-made yoke just for you. Just for you. And then he says, I, I, want, I want you to work, but I want you to ha have a better life. You see, see, I think we learned this lesson from what Jesus has said. That, that rest is not so much about inactivity as much as it, is it, as it is perhaps a condition of your soul. That, that's real rest in the Bible. It's not so much about inactivity, but it's about that inner disposition. In fact, the prophet Isaiah would say it like this in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. He says, those who find rest in the Lord will 
find strength and they will mount up with wings like eagles. Now I was thinking about that, you know, uh, many of you like me, where you've seen birds around you, right, that, that go to flight, whether it's a pigeon or, or a dove, or I was thinking of a quail because, you know, right about Thanksgiving, we, we used to go do bird hunting, and, and I love to go bird hunting with Jamie's family, uh, that's who I learned to bird hunt through, and um, we would go quail hunting, and, and quail, whenever they take off, you, you could hear them, it was like, poof, you know, and, and, and it seems like such a struggle for them, I, they're, they're almost like little, you know, rats that, with wings or something, you know, but they, they, they take off. And, it, and it's like just such a struggle for them as they take off. But, but notice the, the writer here, that, that Isaiah, he, he doesn't say, mount up on wings like quail. <laughs> or doves. Or pigeons. He says eagles. Eagles are so majestic, aren't they? I mean, I love watching eagles. If you've ever watched an eagle take off, it, 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 it's, it's not like he just starts flapping his wings crazily, is it? No, it's usually just like one, bam, and he's gone. And it's almost as if you watch an eagle, he kind of looks around, and it's like, hey, watch this, right? And, 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 you know, here's the point. Here's no way of saying that. It. It's not so much about flapping as it is flying. And I don't know what that says to you in your life, but I hope it says something. Because sometimes all we do is flap. And we work. And we try. And we, could, and we try to control. And we try to manipulate. You see, that's the reason rest is not so much about inactivity as much as it is a condition of the soul. And Jacob, he's trying to learn this. And I think if he were here today, he would say, man, the more I tried to control and manipulate things, the worse things just got and got out of control. And, and you know this to be true. And here's the point. Self-reliance, it will wear you out, won't it? Trusting only in yourself, it will literally wear you out. And listen, the reason I know that is because even if you get success, right, whatever it is in your life, even if you get success, you know what's going to go to your head? It's going to become arrogance. It's going to become prideful. And then you got to keep raising that bar, whatever that bar is, right? And so even if you succeed, that's what's going to happen. And when you fail, you know what? It's not going to go to your head. It's going to go to your heart. And it's going to beat you down. And you're going to feel like such a failure. You see, self-reliance, it, it, it will wear you out. And so it's interesting, God comes to him. This, this passage that we read at the very beginning in, in chapter 32, God comes to him and it finally catches up with Jacob. And he's running from Esau, he's running from Laban. He's, he's, he's in fact split his possessions in two different ways because he thinks to himself, okay, if I get caught one way or the other, it won't destroy me if, if perhaps I have one half here and one half here. He's so exhausted from trying to run this race of life, and rely only on himself. And so God wrestles with him. And, and, and it's such a wrestling match, right? That, that here he is all alone, and they wrestle till daybreak, and he takes and he, and he, he wrenches his socket, which means he, he, he just can't do anything else. I mean, he's just hanging on for dear life. And he's like, I'm not going to let go, God, unless you bless me. And so he says, okay, well, what's your name? As if God didn't know. And he says, Jacob. What, what do we say it meant earlier? Deceiver, right? Manipulator. God's like, no. No, no, no. I, I'm going to change your name. Which, by the way, is something we see all throughout the Bible. Jesus does it many times in the New Testament. He says, from now on, you're going to be called Israel. Because you fought with God, the Bible says, and with men, and have won. God's like, no, no, no. You're no longer going to be defined by your past. You're no longer going to be defined by your dysfunctional family. You're not going to be defined by your attempts at control and manipulation. I'm changing your name today. The name Israel, it means God will prevail. And it's this idea, he's like, Jacob, 
I just need you to find rest in me. I need you to stop wrestling. I need you to trust. And there are times where we can relate to this so well, where we just feel like, you know what, we're maxed out. We're running a million miles an hour. We're flapping as hard as we can. And listen, God's not looking to shame you. He's looking to show compassion. He's looking to tell you to take his yoke upon you. It was custom made for you. He's got a better way, a better life. And, and I think when it comes to the Christmas message, I think this is what God says to us so very, very often. I want to give you something that you may not have even know you needed. I want to give you something that you didn't perhaps even know to ask for. I want to, I want to give you something certainly that you will never be able to deserve. And through the details of the Christmas story that we see here in Matthew, even through the family tree of Jesus, it's this invitation where God is saying to you right now, he's saying to me, would you just come? Just come to me. Take what it is that I have come to give you to get that rest for your soul. Stop, stop flapping so hard. You see, God meets Jacob at his greatest time of need. And he does in him what only God can do. And it's simply amazing. There's a scripture I want to leave you with this morning. And I don't know why, but I feel like God just laid it on my heart to share with you as we start this series and end this message. And it's one I think that we can all relate to, especially as it comes to this idea of trusting in God and leaning into God and, and not trying to manipulate or control. Because what I really think God wants from us is just a broken vessel. Just like, just like Jacob. In Psalm 51 Verse 16, this is God's message to us. It says, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. And listen to what it says. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. I don't care how broken you feel. God has created a yoke just for you. And what he wants is just for you to come in all of your brokenness and allow him to use you as his vessel. A vessel of grace. A vessel of mercy. A vessel of forgiveness. A vessel of love. For God to do only what he can do in your heart and in your life. Let's pray together. God, we just thank you.